beach of Skaha Lake uh, and I'm here today with Eric Mercier of Juice Imports. Thank you so much. And uh, a la Marissa Ross, we are drinking and sipping this nickel Cabernet Franc straight out of the bottle. So um, let's jump right into it. Um, Eric specializes in importing natural wine. So that leads me to my first question. What is natural wine and why do you have such a boner for it? Yeah. Uh, so natural wine, as, as for my definition of what it is, uh, it's a wine that is farmed organically, um, ethically, sustainably, uh, in a way that's not harmful to the environment and in a way that actually captures uh, the terroir in the grapes. I think when you add things extraneously, excessively to the soil or, or spraying excessively and, and, and killing uh, sort of all the microorganisms and, and, and bigger than that, uh, that's obviously not gonna translate terroir into the actual grapes themselves and then on the other side it's it's all about winemaking um, it's all about not manipulating the wine not using additives um, so it's harvesting the grapes when they have the appropriate amount of acidity instead of just acidifying it's uh, not adding stabilizers or tannins to change the flavor or profile of the actual wine uh, it's about not fining and not filtering it's about um, again, just not manipulating the wine in, in ways that are, uh, again, less than natural. Um, get a lot of harassment over the, the name natural wine because obviously wines, you know, it, it's kind of hard to call something a natural product. That's mm -hmm. just not the way that these things work. But, you know, it's kind of hard to hate on terminology. Like if, if, the, if the idea is sound, it doesn't matter what it's called in my opinion, um, even if it is uh, maybe mildly misleading. Uh, and the reason why I'm obsessed with it is that I had always been misled, I think, by most winemakers, and I think most consumers are misled, mm -hmm. frankly, about how their wines are made, where their wines come from. Um, you know, they, they have this, this image in their head of this little old lady walking through a field, picking grapes, putting them in a little basket on her back, carrying them up to the winery, you know, stomping on the grapes with their feet, uh, and then the wine ferments, and then it goes into a bottle, and that's where you get your, like, beautiful bottle of E&J Gallo. Uh, <laughs> that's not the way it works. It, it's chemical farming in a mass scale. Um, you know, the tractors are uh, robotic out there, and it's... Just, you know, it, it's not real winemaking. And then, you know, we went to a winery a couple of years ago in California that makes more wine than the entirety of Canada, and they have 45 people working there. So if that's not mechanization, I, I don't know what mm. is, frankly. So natural wines is sort of the antithesis of that. It's just wines made from organic grapes with no other additives, you okay. know, other than maybe a little bit of sulfur just to make sure the wine actually ends up at the consumer right. without going, you know, turning to vinegar. Yeah. So. So on the organic note, we um, I was just at some vineyards down in Oliver, um, some Pinot Noir and Muscat vineyards, and the conversation about organic um, practices came up, and um, the grower we were speaking to specifically kind of debunked it a little bit because proximity is an issue, right? Mm. So what's your sort of, I don't know, response to that type of philosophy? Totally. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple things that are very misleading about organics. First of all, organic wines uh, legally in North America can have 150 different additives. So if you see organic on a label, that doesn't mean it's a natural wine. In fact, it most likely has lots of additives to it. Um, so that's a major thing. The other major thing with organics is it isn't always better for the environment. And I think a lot of people might argue me on this, but if you can spray non-organic pesticides, herbicides, whatever you need, you know, you think you need to use in the vineyard uh, once or twice a year, as opposed to using organic pesticides and herbicides like 50 times a year in order to get the same results. Sometimes those things, you know, sometimes the organics is not actually better for the environment. So that's why we like our, the people that I import uh, to be maybe more thoughtful about their approach to organics. Um, and try and come up with other ways. But then, yeah, again, you can be in a certified organic vineyard and the vineyard right next to you is not mm -hmm. organic and they're spraying, you know, up the wazoo and all that stuff is trickling into your vineyard. Um, are you really organic at that point? And, and sort of what's the, what's the issues with that? Um, ultimately, I, I think that people should convert to organics regardless of what their neighbors are doing. I think it's important and I think that just like any other sort of movement, uh, people need to 
you needs to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. So somebody needs to do it, and then hopefully everybody else will follow suit uh, because they care about the environment eventually. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if they see their neighbors doing it and the success that they're getting, whether that be through their grapes, um, getting more dollars per ton, uh, or getting more accolades for the wines that they're making, because I think that organically grown grapes fundamentally, like if done well, will always taste better than the equivalent non-organically grown grape. Um, but I, th- I think they just have to do it anyways, uh, despite these sort of things. So. What about the argument about labor though? Um, we heard a figure today that it's 30 to 40% more costly to operate an organic farm as opposed to conventional or non-organic. Totally, yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely the, that's definitely the case. I've heard some like even gnarlier figures than that, honestly, over the over the time. And the amount of extra money that you get for grapes isn't necessarily gonna um, isn't gonna necessarily equate to like more economic gains for you. Um, but that being said, as long as those things equal out, yeah, it may look like more work on the service surface. But if you are getting paid that thirty to 40% more, whatever that, that stat was, um, it's ultimately like the right thing to do. Yeah. And not only that, but if you want to be like a serious winery, a serious winemaker, um, I think that you just have to be working with grapes that are actually expressing the land regardless of sort of what the price point is. Right. Um, yeah. Sort of molding it into what you want it to be. Yeah, exactly. And and whether that be through farming or winemaking, I think a lot of people uh, forget that the farming is what makes the grapes taste the way that they do. Yeah. You know, you can fuck around with it as much as you want in the winery, but you can't make certain grapes taste like other grapes. You can't make certain terroir features show in wines that were not grown on that terroir. Um, and so ultimately, you know, when people are fucking around in the vineyard, it, it can change the the end profile just as much, I yeah. guess. But, yeah. um, so I wanted to go back to your comment about manipulation. So that's a term that's thrown around a lot and you sort of alluded to it a little bit about additives in the cellar and whatnot. Um, some um, opposing opinions that I've heard from other winemakers and this is all throughout the world. Um, in fact, the winemaker from St. Innocent, you're probably familiar mm-hmm. with them. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I he street. was quite opposed to the whole kind of uh, I don't know, I guess the trendiness of mm. natural wine. And then I've also heard other, other opinions that, you know, as winemakers, they have a toolkit essentially that is available to them. And if they do their job well, those manipulations should go undetected. So are you completely opposed to conventional winemaking as a whole, or is it case by case basis? So I think that everybody should strive to make natural wine, frankly, but I also don't agree with some of the uh, like militant natural wine drinkers out there that think everything else is plonk. Um, I worked at a winery that that did lots of like really micro manipulations. Like anything you can think of, they did, but they did it in really really small amounts, just to like tweak and tweak and tweak. Yeah. Um, and so you know they think that they see something specific in in the terroir of their vineyard, and then they try and emphasize those things. And I don't think that that's like fundamentally a bad thing um i just would prefer to see the vineyard for what it's actually giving you not what you think it's supposed to be giving right. you um when it comes to to manipulation i think that a lot of people even in the industry um don't understand the extent that most commercial wines are manipulated uh for instance we went to a fairly prestigious winery in Napa Valley. And we went and we looked at the, the vineyards and uh, we're like, holy crow, like this vineyard is basically, it, it's it's raisinated. Like the, the grapes on the vines had literally shriveled up. Um, and we're like, man, like the sugar's gonna be out of control on this. The, we tasted the grapes and like they had no acid to them. And it was gonna make a wine that was supposed to be, you know, $100 US a bottle. And uh, we're like, hey, like, did you guys miss the picking date on this? Like, are you guys coming out here like today or tomorrow to pick these? Like, no, we'll probably let it hang for another week. Um, And then we'll water it back because we like those like, again, jammy raisinated flavors. They're like, we'll water it back because it's gonna be 
you know, 17% alcohol. If we were to actually make it into wine right now, 17% alcohol and then probably still sweet. And so they're like, we'll water it back until it's, you know, 14 and a half, 15% alcohol, but then we'll have diluted the acid. So then we'll add back some acid. Um, that will also unfortunately dilute the color. So we're gonna add in some make a purple to balance that out and make it a little bit richer and deeper. Um, it's like, we'll probably have to do some stuff with tannin, um, you know, add some finishing tannin to give it a little bit more structure because most of those things, you know, if you have grapes with those like flaccid skins, that's how the wine feels, is it feels soft and it feels, you know, it doesn't have the grip that, uh, you know, especially wines of that caliber and, and aging potential yep. should have. So they're like, cool, we're gonna do that. And they were super open and honest with us wow. about it. And I was like, cool. Um, you know, and not only that, but it's like you look at things like reverse osmosis machines in in California. So in 2000, I want to say it was 2000, uh, maybe it was 2017, 2016, 2017, 600 wineries use reverse osmosis on their wines. That's 600 wineries. That's, that's not 600 different products. That's 600 wineries that probably all had maybe a dozen wines each, if not a lot more than that. Like if you look at the E&J Gallo portfolio, we're talking about 50 wines probably. And so 600 times 12 or, you know, 20 different wines, it's a lot of wines going through like a really manipulative process, a process where they literally break the wine into all its components, remove the things they don't like, and then put it back together. Yeah. So it's like, that's a huge percentage of wineries in California that are, are manipulating on literally the most egregious level. Yeah. Um, so I think this like toolbox thing, it's, I think it's thrown around a lot. Uh, like there's a lot of tools that natural winemakers use as well. Yeah. Uh, you know? just which tools should we be using i don't know i hate to get like this extreme but it just popped into no, my head no you're but passionate like, about it i love it yeah but it's like you look at things like you know like we have atomic bombs like uh should like that, we use that, them <laughs> that's a tool we have that could potentially end conflict or do that but are we gonna do that should we do that should we try and use less invasive methods and so yeah. it's sort of the same philosophy where it's like you know the those machines and those techniques are like the atomic bomb equivalent of the winemaking world. Like, can you ease it there, coax it there without, you know, necessarily doing these, these really massive interventions? And if we have to do something on that, that sort of level, can we do small little versions of that that are maybe, again, a little less, uh, a little less intense. So what's your response to people who um, make these big claims that natural winemaking is essentially masquerading as like dirty or unhygienic winemaking? I'm sure you've heard that before. Totally, yeah. Uh, you know, for, for somebody that's like, again, for in the Okanagan right now, I've tasted a lot of flawed conventional wines from this place, frankly. Uh, you know, I think there's as many flaws in conventional wines at, uh, at the moment as, as there are in natural wines. And I think that, you know, it's the same anywhere. Like a, a, a lot of people try and get away with it uh, or they don't care or they don't have good palates or whatever it happens to be. There's bad wine everywhere. And it's just unfortunate that um, they're using a marketing tool. I think that, again, like like if we want to say that everything that, that's written on the bottle is a marketing tool, things like organic wines, we're like, oh yeah, people are making organic wines like just as a, as a, um, they're exploiting it. Yeah, exactly. They're exploiting it. They're using it as an excuse for making bad wines or whatever it happens to be. Um, I, I'm like, okay, fine. Like, it, at least they're doing, they, at least they're doing that. And it's, you know, it's up to the consumer to decide whether or not they're, they're good. Uh, and it's up to us as people in the industry not to support those wines. Yeah. Um, and have those conversations. Like, you know, I wouldn't sell somebody a flawed conventional wine any more mm. than I'd sell somebody a flawed natural wine. Um, it's unfortunate that, that some people are, are more willing to consume flawed natural wine just because it is natural. Yeah. Um, it's like the same thing as like the, yeah, this like duck that's like, like one foot away We have a duck in our right midst. Now. Yeah. <laughs> He's interjecting. He wants he a sip like of our natural wine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but it, it's the same thing as like the health food craze. Like so many people would rather eat like really bad tasting healthy food than just do the research and educate yeah, themselves. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's like sort of the same thing with, with natural wines in a sense. Like they rather drink something that's natural and maybe doesn't taste good or at least that we wouldn't think is good. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously 
everybody's palate's gonna be different. Like some people might li- might like cork taint or might like <laughs> might like. That's- <laughs> my, I'd love my, to meet that person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they exist. I, I remember, I think it was like Terry Thies that wrote about it in, in one of his books and said that um, he poured this really amazing bottle for everybody. He forgot to check it. Uh, and one of the guests came up and was like, this is one of the most amazing wines I've ever tasted. And he's like, oh good, I was really excited to taste this. And he puts the wine up to his nose and it's corked. And he's like, who am I to say that like this isn't... That's true. He, he likes, like that person likes it a lot. Yeah. He's like, fundamentally, this is a flaw as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, same can be said for Britannomyces, Volta, Cindy, yeah, blah, exactly. blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I have certain wines that I like that have small amounts of any of those yeah. things, but I, I definitely know winemakers that would, again, rather remove them or yeah. do whatever they can to yeah. avoid them. So. Um, so, since we're in the Okanagan and you've been here wine tasting, um, who are some of the standout wineries that have really kind of piqued your interest? Mm. Definitely. Um, so there's kind of a couple of classics that I, um, when I used to work at a wine shop, I used to sell a lot because I really loved what they were doing. And it's cool to been to, to come out here for the first time in I think like four years and, and revisit them um, and actually see how much they've evolved mm. and, and progressed. Um, one of them being Bella. Um, Jay over at Bella is, is absolutely amazing. Um, his farming techniques are, are uh everything that I would want like the world class like you could go to vineyards in in France and Spain and Austria and like you would see the exact techniques that he's using and they're working out to the same level mm-hmm. like it's, it's it's he's not just using the techniques and just hoping that it's going to get by like he's using the techniques and then the fruit is at the quality level that it should be um, he makes uh, exclusively bubbles although there are some like secret bottles uh, on the side that we got to sip of him fooling around with other things. I don't think it'll be like Bella label necessarily, but I think they, they made a little bit of Chardonnay for themselves to drink basically. Um, but he focuses almost exclusively on, on sparkling wine. And I think that the climate here is, is really great for sparkling wine. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense that he's doing that. He's making it a little bit different than you would see uh, like champagne or something like that made. Um, and. I don't think that we should try and make champagne here mm-hmm. any more than anybody should try mm-hmm. and make champagne anywhere else in the world. So I like that he's doing sparkling wine, but it's, it's Okanagan sparkling yeah. wine, and it's as complex and, and uh, nuanced and frankly drinkable and useful and you know I- important for us to drink, I guess, um, as any wine from anywhere else in the world. So that was really cool. Uh, we went and visited Synchromesh. Um, Alan at Synchromesh is, again, doing incredible stuff. We hung out with him for I don't know, maybe an hour, and I think he talked about wine for like all of five minutes. Mm. Uh, The rest of the time he was just talking about like the soils, he was talking about the wildlife, he pointed out basically every tree uh, on the property, he was pointing out things like, oh, like, did you know that this particular uh, endangered frog lives in this pond over here, Mm. and this is its mating ritual, and this is like its life cycle, and he just ranted about it, I was like, cool, you were so passionate about the land first, yeah. um, and then it just so happens that that land yields really, really amazing wine, and he is just, like, talented enough and thoughtful enough to, like, translate that that beautiful land yeah. into a beautiful bottle that that captures everything along the way without him having to, to manipulate it. So yeah. I think the wines from Synchromesh are, are absolutely gorgeous. It's like, again, especially Riesling. Like, I think that, you know, I could drink a thousand Yeah, no, he's his. definitely renowned for that. And that, that notion that you brought up about being so passionate about his property, um, mm-hmm. it just reminds me of this article that I just wrote about terroir, but they're in Spanish. They have a term called ter- terruño. Mm-hmm. I guess that's how you would pronounce it, and it's not about the land that belongs to the man, but the man that belongs to the land. Mm, and totally, so yeah, that's I really that. powerful because, like, yeah. that's definitely like what he would identify with for sure. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I think that those have both been really amazing. Um, I just discovered um, Sunday in August. Yeah, Sunday in August. Uh, I drank two bottles yesterday. Um, they, the bottles were actually gifted by. Uh, Jay from Bella um, we were just asking him what he's excited about and he's like oh man like if you haven't had these these are so good so he literally just gave us a bottle nice. and like this is one of the things that I've always been really aggro about about the Okanagan is the lack of camaraderie um, it's so 
competitive uh, here, I think, that I think people forget, like, the high tide rises all boats, like, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And so to see somebody do that uh, was really cool. And then to taste the wines, like, so we had a Riesling yesterday, literally right here, like, on this beach. Um, and it was spectacular. Like, mm. it's just, it's, um, of the wines that I've tasted from the Okanagan, it's the one that uh, recently that I've had that tastes most like uh, alive and energetic and and it's like there's no I don't know I hate I hate talking about energies because I'm, I don't believe in energies um, per se necessarily um, but this wine just like it, it had a, a soul to it it was very vibrant very, I don't know it, it was outlandish it was, it was super super mm, delicious that's cool uh, and then he did a skin fermented Pinot Gris him her I'd actually have no idea who makes the wine um, frankly, but I'm definitely going to look into it. But uh, Skin yeah, Fermented Pinot you know, Gris, that was actually really, really well done. I think so many people in the Okanagan um, do these like Skin Fermented Pinot Gris styles. Um, Miss the mark? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's more of a novelty novelty than uh, being a really good wine. And this yeah. was like, it was awesome. It was bright, it was juicy, but it was textural at the same time. Perfect level of ripeness, like they, they didn't go overboard. Um, yeah, it was just, they nailed it. Cool. It, so. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You're you're selling these guys. Totally. I gotta, I gotta track yeah. them down. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, on that note, uh, just to finish off, I always finish off my interviews with um, what your three death row wines would be if you mm. had to pick today. It could be different tomorrow. It could be different in a week. But what would they be today? Totally. Um, definitely. Um, well, Hue for sure. Oh, um, nice. You know, I like I can't remember when it was, but there was like a period in my life where my my actual password for my like computer or whatever <laughs> was 1947 Huey, just reminding me that I need to drink that wine at one that's point in my life because every other vintage that I've ever had has been spectacular, and that's often considered. So like I can log into the, the Juice best. Imports backend. Yeah, you can try. It's definitely not that anymore, but um, that. Um, probably like Armand Rousseau, Gervais Chambertin is like, it's just stupid. It's just, it's, oh, it's what Burgundy is supposed to taste like yeah. and never does. Mm. Um, it's just, again, like that energetic quality that, that, I don't know, but all the complexity, like when something is that level of joyous, um, at the same time as being that level of intriguing, mm -hmm. that's like, that's when you've really nailed a wine, is when it's drinkable and also complex. 